Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on uh, uh, the book of James. We will pray and get into our uh, chapters for the day. I want to request somebody from class to please go ahead and lead in prayer. Anyone can do that, please. Can I pray? Uh, Father, yes, Elijah. In the name of our Heavenly Father, once again, we are most grateful and thankful unto you for the grace and the mercies that you have shown to us this day. Father, we are committing our class once again into your mighty hands, O God, that we pray that you come and lead this course, come and guide us. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, grant us understanding. Open our hearts and open our minds to receive in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, commit our pastor into your hands also, that you continue to guide her in her utterances in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, so we've now come to James chapter 3. And uh, that is the chapter that we are going to be studying. We started... We started uh, talking about the power of the tongue. Uh, so let me just go back there. Okay. Uh, I think we uh, only read through it, but then we didn't. We didn't really go ahead and uh, uh, understand it. So how about we start with James chapter three and verse two? Uh, if someone can please read from verse two. To verse 6, then I'll go ahead and explain that. So we're in James 3, and uh, we are going to read verses 2 to 6. James chapter 3, verse 2 to 6. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stop, stumble toward his perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we churn their whole body. Oh, sorry. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are churned by a very small ruler where the palace desire. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by heaven. Yes, thank you, Asha. Uh, so a pertinent message about the tongue, which is comparatively a uh, smaller muscle right in the body uh, if you look at uh, other muscles but um, something incredibly powerful about the tongue and uh, that's what james is speaking about now why is he you know, talking about uh, earlier he said trials when you endure trials um, you know count it all joy and now he's talking about the power of the tongue he will also talk about um, uh, inequality among believers so in a sense it is demystifying for us the idea of a perfect early church because when we read the book of Acts, somewhere we get this image that there was nothing wrong with the early church they were all like angels holy spirit was poured out on them they were doing all the right things well yes because the holy spirit was poured out and they were being uh, uh, you know uh, led by the power of the spirit many things shifted for the early church and they were in a time of revival signs wonders miracles all that were uh, taking place however when it came to uh, the character or uh, let's say becoming like jesus aspect of believers there were issues now we know that james was the leader of the church during these times so he's having to address these matters to the believers they were not perfect and i'm sure the reason why he's talking about the tongue here is because people were not taming their tongues and uh, there must have been many things said uh, spoken that were hurtful and causing uh, division among the people and so he had to address 
uh, this issue and say that uh, we as believers must manage our members well because uh, self control is the fruit of the spirit uh, and uh, if we are really walking with the lord then being able to manage the words we speak uh, it becomes very very important okay so from verse 3 he is giving examples of bits in horses mouths um, uh, that can turn the whole body of the horse and we are aware of this how uh, you know people control horses then he also talks about ships and uh, he talks about the very small rudder of the ship which the pilot or the navigator controls such that the ship moves in a certain direction so now keeping these two things in mind he speaks about the tongue uh, in our body and he says look even the tongue like the bit uh, like the rudder it's a very small part of our body uh, but you see that it has uh the power of great impact so the direction of the horse or the direction of the ship are determined by those small parts that we just now uh, referred to similarly the direction of our life is dependent on the way we use our tongue he gives one more analogy here and that is of a little fire a little fire now we are aware uh, of of regions in the world that have burned for months that have burned for uh, you know uh, i don't know even up to a year maybe without being able to control the forest fires uh, and how did that whole devastation begin with a small spark of uh, a flame uh, so he is talking about the tongue like that flame of fire now if you just spark it it can even cause a forest fire so this is uh, in in the negative context first we said the tongue can provide direction for one's life which is a positive thing now the tongue can also cause havoc like fire now that's a negative thing so now he goes on to saying verse 6 he says tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell so now in the negative context because maybe he's addressing some of the uh, problems in the speaking of believers so he's saying when we speak negative when we speak or let me not just say generally negative things which are not aligned to the word of god then what happens the tongue becomes that powerful part that defiles the entire body when not aligned to the word of god so in that context he is saying it uh now yes he has put it in this way and he says uh, in uh, the good news bible it it says uh, it sets on fire the entire course of our existence with the fire that comes to it from hell itself so uh, when we are not aligned to the word many things go wrong so that's that's the indication here but if we were to consider the flip side of it first james is bringing a message of warning and that's why he's talking like this but if we turn it around when the tongue is not aligned to the word it's like you know a fire uh, that comes from hell itself but what if the tongue is aligned to the word of god then what can happen you see it can affect our whole body it can affect our whole body to bring blessing it can affect our lives to bring blessing it can affect the lives of others to bring blessing so both are a possibility okay so uh, the negative we have seen but then the positive is also a possibility and so we as believers have to make a choice as far as our tongue is concerned and decide how we want to use it now coming to the taming of the tongue that's the next section here could somebody please read from verse 7 through 12 chapter 3 Verses seven through twelve, please. For every kind of beast and birds, of reptile and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, 
example of deadly poison. Um, plus two, nine, and ten also. So you can you can read till twelve, uh, Asha. Very fast. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and wither from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grape wine, bear figs? Does no spring yield both salt water and fresh? Thank you. Thank you, Asha. So here, uh, he talks about the importance of taming the tongue. And look at the analogy that he gives. He says, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. It's amazing. Even today, as we consider um, uh, you know, places where animals are kept, we can see how man has trained them we can see how he gives instruction and these huge creatures maybe uh, water creatures or even uh, you know you see lions in in, in a circus they listen and uh, they follow instructions and it's incredible that even beasts wild beasts can be tamed but in comparison uh, james is saying but no man can tame the tongue Wow, that, that is something that even wild beasts can be trained, but the tongue is much more difficult to train, okay, comparatively. And he goes on to saying it's unruly evil full of deadly poison. So when it is untamed or when words come out of the tongue, which are not aligned to the thoughts of God, the mind of God. So... We, we could even say it's out of control right now because it's not aligned to what God wants and his purposes. Then what, what is the nature right, of, of the tongue? Uh, the, the tongue is uncontrolled, unrestrainable, and it's like you know a restless evil because all kinds of words come out of it that can hurt, that can destroy, that can... Um, uh, you know, cause division uh, that can that can cause uh, maybe even unre uh, unrepairable damage, right? And that is why he's saying that out of control tongue is he uses the terms deadly poison. Okay, deadly poison. What does deadly poison do? Deadly poison kills. It destroys. And that's the same thing. You know that can happen with the tongue. Now, uh, you know, people people say that um, uh, sticks and uh, stones uh, break the bones, but then you know you can you can actually speak any words, and it it should be fine. Like even children, when we are uh, nurturing them, we are instructing them in the ways of the Lord. But sometimes, you know, the hurt that uh, a stick brings can heal faster than the hurt that the words bring. So the tongue is that powerful and uh, James is warning the believers about the power of the tongue and be very careful uh, not to have an uncontrolled tongue or a tongue which is not aligned to the word of God, the purposes of God. And then another thing he says, no, he's, he's saying uh, this is an irony that the so-called believers, the same tongue, they speak blessing and with the same tongue, what do they do? They curse people. So he's just asking them this question. How is it that this whole double, um, uh, you know, um, not a double life, but just you sort of un have this unsettled in your mind where the tongue can be used to bless God, the Father, God and the Father, and it can be used to curse men. You're doing both things at the same time with the same tongue. And he says that should not be the case. Um, and you know, a good example for us to understand is how our language changes, uh, particularly on Sundays or maybe on Saturday, if you have uh, some meeting or prayer going on. We, we are very comfortable with the so-called Christian language that we are used to speaking. But does that kind of uh, uh, pleasant, 
uplifting, uh, blessed language continue as we step out of the, these meetings. Let's say we are on the road and we are in traffic or we are um, shopping. We are with our own families. That's another test uh, or at another level. Uh, but how is it that believers can have one way of speech uh, in certain settings and a completely different way of speech in another setting? So these are the challenges. And James is uh, helping the believer know that let's have consistency. Uh, let not. And, and you know he says things like blessing and cursing from the same tongue. He says fresh water and bitter from the same spring opening. Uh, uh, and he also says, you know, can a fig tree bear olives or grape wine bear figs so he's saying let's not mix the two blessing or cursing choose and the choice is obvious we as believers we have to choose blessing because that's why our tongues have been created so that's the way in which he's addressing um, this this matter of using words and the power of words and about words there's so much that we can study uh, in the particularly in the book of proverbs uh, that words are so powerful words uh, can even direct our lives so that's about the tongue please feel free to pause and uh, you know ask any question if at all uh, you need clarification uh, anything to talk about or can we proceed can we go ahead Anything about the tongue? OK, I think uh, it's quite obvious because we've all experienced the impact and the effects of the tongue our entire lives. So you know we understand. Let's move on. We go to the next section here. This is about wisdom. So uh, as we can see, themes are shifting. Uh, when you know James is talking, yes, Christopher. Yes, uh, Pastor. I just wanted to uh, um, just sort of make a point here, where um, you know, I mean, one of the gifts of the Spirit is, you know, uh, you know, speaking in tongues and uh, you know, also in interpretation of tongues. So that seems to be a complete sort of, you know, the, the pendulum seems to be uh, you know, moved <laughs> towards a gift, and. Um, um uh, so i mean as human beings we have we have the tongue which is is obviously um you know can can produce a lot of evil but there's also this gift which which is there so um but that is only i think um you know utilized um uh, you know when we commune um, in our in our, in our prayer to god so um i just wanted to you know sort of make that point and you know if you have any comment on that uh, no, I agree with you, Christopher. You know, that's a gift that God has given us. And we can use our tongues for speaking in tongues, which is, of course, a blessing. We're able to commune with God. We're able to edify ourselves uh, and bring a message to others to edify them as well. So, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So let's now go to the next part here. We'll read uh, from verse 13 to verse 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in, in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Uh, please go until 18, Christopher. Can't hear you anymore. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. So here, uh, James is asking 
the question who is wise and understanding among you in other words how does wisdom and understanding get demonstrated out of one's life so let's say somebody has wisdom somebody has understanding how would we know through their life when their life has good conduct or if simply put we would say good behavior right uh, then we can say that yes this individual is walking with wisdom and understanding and he also adds that he says works are done in the meekness of wisdom so the person is doing what they are doing through wisdom and he adds meekness of wisdom something to be understood when we say wisdom uh humility is attached to wisdom okay so that's the beauty of this he says meekness of wisdom so wisdom is not independent of humility so the person who is uh, said to have wisdom understanding has good um, conduct good behavior associated with good works which are done in humility okay so that's what he's saying let's move on then he says but if you have bitter envy and self seeking in your hearts do not boast and lie against the truth he goes on this wisdom does not descend from above but is earthly sensual demonic for where uh, envy and self seeking exists confusion and every evil thing are there so now in contrast in contrast we saw somebody with wisdom good behavior in contrast if people operate in he also uses the term bitter envy bitter envy is uh, it's an extreme sort of um, level of jealousy okay. it's an extreme level of jealousy now if that is the motivator of what one is doing now let's add to that you know, he also states uh, something like uh, self seeking self seeking okay if a person is motivated by extreme jealousy and selfishness what do you think will come out of there you know we cannot expect anything good to come out of that because um there there will be quarrels there will be strife there will be manipulation there will be all kinds of evil we can just keep listing things out and uh, that is the danger which he is warning us about he's saying there are matters in life which we can try to solve either motivated by godly wisdom or our own thought process you know self seeking selfish way of looking at things um having jealousy uh, against others and trying to make something happen so things can be resolved in a godly way or in an ungodly way but when we pick the ungodly way you know he is saying it is earthly it is sensual it is demonic earthly is it's not accompanying god's wisdom sensual is it's about our own pleasures it's about our own gratification demonic is it is influenced by the uh, powers of darkness so this kind of wisdom or you know earthly wisdom which is uh, opposing godly wisdom is not going to produce anything good and uh, he goes on in verse 16 he says when there is envy and self seeking these are the motivators what can we expect you know people try to solve problems but then problems get created there will be confusion and every evil thing are there so we must be warned against uh, you know this kind of motivation and the behavior that comes out of it so stay out of it it's very simple uh, if if we go back to the writings of paul he talks about the fruit of the spirit he talks about uh, uh, you know uh, staying away from the fruit of the flesh so these are all included in the fruit of the flesh and one needs to be careful about that but in verse 17 comes back to speaking about wisdom godly wisdom earlier he said good behavior will come out of it he said that wisdom is tied with humility now in 17 he gives more features of godly wisdom and what are some of the terms he uses he says it is first pure then 
peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So these are the features of godly wisdom. What does it mean? Pure. So whenever we are trying to solve a problem and we think that we have applied wisdom, we can ask ourselves these questions. Uh, is the way I have worked things out pure? Is it uh, peaceable? Is it gentle? Uh, uh, is it you know willing to yield to, let's say, God is prompting us at that moment? Uh, are we willing to accept the new idea that God is bringing our way? So in this manner, we can test it out whether our wisdom is really a heavenly wisdom. So the features, I'll just explain it to us. Pure is obviously not having any evil in it, not having any works of the flesh in it. Peaceable is being done in such a way that it doesn't um, uh, produce disunity. Okay? Or it's done in a way that is pleasant and it promotes togetherness. And unity. Gentle is an expression of kindness, politeness, courtesy, compassion. Um, willing to yield is simply teachable, where one is willing to listen uh, when when um, ideas are put forth. Full of mercy. Mercy has to do with an expression of compassion, love, tenderness. Good fruits is glorifying God, edifying people. No partiality is uh, fair. You know, there's equity in what is being done. No hypocrisy is. It's genuine and sincere. It's not two-faced that one thing is being done here and then another thing is being spoken elsewhere. But uh, it is genuine and sincere. So these are the indicators of divine wisdom. When we say that we are walking in wisdom, uh, these features ought to be a part of uh, what is being done and uh, when we do this, there will be an outcome to this. And he says, the fruit of righteousness. Okay, uh, Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So he says that it will promote peace. Now, he's adding a different term. Uh, this is also acts of wisdom. But now he states it as the fruit of righteousness or the right thing which is done. And the results that it produces, it will lead to peace and unity. So yes, so these are some instructions of uh, James to the people in this uh, chapter. We talked primarily about tongue and we talked about wisdom. Okay, So let's now move ahead to chapter 4. Uh, but before that, any anything that uh, you want to discuss or uh, can we just move to the next chapter? All right, so uh, let's continue. We are in chapter four now. Um, we will read from verse one to verse five. Could somebody please go ahead and read it for us? Chapter four, James chapter four, verse one to five. Mm. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do have because you yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Avni. So coming back to this thought of the issues in church, the early church, James as the leader of the church of Jerusalem, uh, is observing these matters. Now, I know those of us who are pastors, we understand that when people are taught in the ways of God, it takes some time for them to catch on, um, to yield to 
the word to yield to the work of the spirit and in the process we may find some matters that need to be addressed because we are here to establish a church we said it's the ground and the pillar of truth uh, and so the church that we are establishing should reflect the nature of god and so when james is noticing that this spirit filled church is still having issues that are arising from where uh, quite obviously they are arising from uh, fleshly lusts now people as paul wrote he, he wrote he said that uh, walk walk by the spirit that you may not gratify the desires of the flesh so even paul had to address these matters and he gave a solution he said walk according to the spirit so that these things don't happen among you now james is also pointing out and uh, it seems like he's noticing quarrels he's noticing fights and uh, the reason is people are trying to promote themselves they are trying to be prominent they're very self seeking uh, and, and for that he he's saying all these things so from verse 1 to verse 3 Uh, he says where do wars fights come from among you do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members remember earlier also he said don't say that god is tempting you but the fact is that we are all tempted because of the desires that we have within ourselves again he points to those same desires and he's saying there are desires for pleasure within us now where do these quarrels fights wars he even uses the term war over here uh, which is you know quite uh, uh, quite um, uh, it's it sounds larger than just a fight so uh, there are challenges there are grave challenges where do these things come from they come from the flesh you know, the ple- the uh, desires that one has not overcome uh, which are a part of their flesh and then he says you lust and you do not have so notice again he is pointing out and he's saying that people's desires are not godly now does god not want to bless us see at the end of the day he is a god of abundance and as we read god's word there are rewards there are blessings uh, yes there are times of testing when we have to wait on the lord and you know sometimes wait and wait and wait doing the right thing before the answers uh, are uh, manifest however trying to push for the rewards or uh, the the blessings in a lustful way that's not a right thing to do so that's what he's saying he's saying there are people uh, obviously he he was noticing that they lust after these blessings they lust after uh, good things that others have so it's it's basically covetousness right covetousness is what covetousness is to want what others have and not be satisfied with what we have so that was all going on uh, in the church so they were lusting they were covetous uh, you murder he says how how is it that he is saying murder the people actually murdering one another uh, likely not when he uses the term murder here we can go back to the reference of the tongue maybe people were just talking ill of one another undermining one another with evil words so uh, in this way what were they trying to do they were trying to obtain they were trying to gain uh, they were trying to have more but he's telling them that the path which they have taken it's not the right path so he says yet you do not have because you're trying to get it in the wrong way but then he shows them the right way he states you don't have because you don't ask where do blessings come from where does reward come from where does uh, every pleasure at his uh, right hand are pleasures forever more where does it come from god is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him so he tells them the right way to get is to get it from god we cannot receive unless god gives it to us isn't it in john chapter 3 uh, also jesus said that it has to come from heaven uh, for us uh, even anointing uh, when elijah was um, elisha was going after elijah elijah said look i can't give it to you because where does it come from all good things come from god 
We've seen that in James 1 verse 17, he says that every good gift comes from the Lord. So he tells the believers, why is it that you don't have? Because you're not asking God for it. So you do not have because you do not ask. So prayer is the right way of receiving blessings into our lives. Then he points out, uh, uh, a problem with prayer also. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So now he's addressing those who may be going to the right source or depending on God for their blessings. But he says, even those who are asking, why is it that they are not getting? Because of the wrong motivation. We are asking for our own pleasures. We are asking amiss. Amiss is, it's not coming from a place of faith. It's not coming from a place, you know, prayer. What is prayer? Real prayer. Uh, uh, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be aligning our will to the will of God. If we recall, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus started with something else. He said, take this cup away from me. As he engaged in prayer, eventually, what happened? He came to the point where he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So aligning our will to the will of God is a powerful way of praying. It's the right way of prayer. But here he says, people are praying. Why are they not getting it? Because our will is not aligned to the will of God. So he says, you you ask amiss. You ask so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So these are matters that he's saying. He's saying you'll get it from God what you want, but you need to ask as per the will of God. Then he goes on to say, verse 4 and 5. You know, it seems to be a different uh, issue that he's addressing here. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, very serious. Okay, he could have um, stated things in a nicer manner to the believers but he is rebuking them and calling them what adulterers and adulteresses very very serious he says friendship with the world is enmity with god so he's now addressing the matter of worldliness where you know we as believers we can know God, we can seemingly want the things of God but we have one foot in the world where we are enjoying all the pleasures of the world, but we are also Christians, we are also believers. So uh, he's addressing this matter and he's saying, we can't do that. And the reason why he is calling them adulterers and adulteresses is because they are lacking faithfulness as far as following after God is concerned. Okay? Uh, and when he says adulteresses, he is using this term because the church is supposed to be the bride of Christ. And it's that equation, you know, the bridegroom and the bride. And we know that in such an equation, uh, faithfulness is, uh, it, it, that's the bedrock. That's the bottom line of such a relationship. And so when we are relating with the Lord as his body and as his church, there's no place for us to um, go with the world and not demonstrate complete faithfulness towards God. And God takes notice of these things. He even says, when we are friends with the world, who are we? We are enemies of God. And uh, he says, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. So that jealousy, is also the jealousy that uh, you know you read about between husbands and wives or, or got to do with faithfulness. When there is unfaithfulness, there is that expression of, of uh, jealousy where uh, something that meant to be, something that was meant to be uh, you know, within the boundaries of marriage, but you know, now that boundary has been trespassed. And that's where the jealousy is applicable. And he says, you know, God. Um, in the old covenant, we read that you know, God was jealous for his people or that he wanted them to be faithful to him and never move out of that place. And that's what he means. He says, 
God is really very, very serious about uh, having our hearts, you know, aligned to His heart. Um, stop with that. Uh, any any other thoughts or comments before we move to the next section here? Okay, so we have seen two major issues addressed over here. Uh, one was the wrong motivation to get from God his blessings. The second one is worldliness and how God takes it seriously, even to the point that he's calling his own people, right? Adulterers, adulteresses. So we have to be very careful and not be worldly Christians. Now coming to uh, the next section here, let's read from verse 6 to verse 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Laminate and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Asha. I couldn't hear some parts of what you uh, are speaking, but let's go on with the explanation here. So now, another aspect that he's coming to, uh, which is about pride and about humility. So what does he say? He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God dresses the God's empowerment, and it says, gives more grace, simply means God empowers increased godly ability to come into our lives. Okay, everyone, uh, did you miss what I was saying just now? Was there a connection? Yes, ma'am. Yes, there's a connection. Little uh, bit. Little bit. Little bit, okay. Okay. Little bit. Okay, no worries. I, I'll just continue. Thank you. So I'm saying in verse 6, we are told that God increases our ability when we are humble. He gives determined to give more empowerment to whom? To the humble. And that is what is key here. That one needs to um, be walk in humility. Humility. What happens? The other thing is walking in pride. But notice it says God resists the proud, and therefore we must resist pride. Okay, so this is about humility. As part of humility, uh, he also says, submit to God, submit to God. Okay, Earl, Earlier we said wisdom is what? It yields godly wisdom. Yields. And see, leading me right now, I submit. 
I submit to the word that I am listening to. I I give my life to the word you know, that is be uh, that is uh, coming to me right now. So in this manner, one can submit themselves to God, and you know, he's talking a little bit about spiritual warfare. He says, resist the devil, and he will flee. So one part of the Christian life is. that satan is our adversary and that he is somebody who will look to create trouble in a believer's life and so when we position ourselves in obedience we should also be careful to resist the devil and he will flee from us um and then you know he goes on to say draw near to god he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So uh, two things here. One is there is an invitation to come close to God. And notice, under the new covenant, Okay, what a beautiful thing. Uh, earlier, when Moses came near the burning bush, what happened? There was an instruction to him. OK, remove your sandals. He could. I'm sure he couldn't go very close to the burning bush because that place was a uh, holy ground. And there was that sense of, of um, uh, holiness of God where Moses could not go draw that near to God, right? So there were all those uh, restrictions and limitations under the old covenant. And we know the picture of the tabernacle also, that people could not enter the Holy of Holies um, uh, unless it was written out and it was only allowed for the high priest in those days in the new covenant now that we have completed the book of hebrews we understand draw near to god and god will draw near to you so there are no limitations restrictions of how close you and i can get to god uh, you know, it's so beautiful. Draw near to God and he will draw near to us. And in the next part here, he just calls us to repentance. Okay, Repentance is um, confession of our sins. Repentance is to know. You know what, what, what is it that is not... You sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then he also says, lament and moan and weep. That's nothing but repent. Walk with repentance before the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So walk with repentance before the Lord. Um, so at this point, let's go ahead. Let's take a break. We will come back. Uh, uh, please don't get off the call. right? Uh, we'll come back and then we will continue with the rest of the portions so thank you